behalf of the Law Society, I'd like to welcome you to uh, this program on law partnerships and just take a, a minute to introduce the, uh, the program leader, Bob Milnes. Um, Bob um, is a graduate of, of McGill University and um, studied law at, uh, at Queens. Uh, he also has uh, a master's in law from uh, Osgoode Hall uh, Law School. Um, he is currently managing partner at uh, Smith Lyons, Torrance, Stevenson and Meyer and, and as such he's eminently qualified to speak about the subject matter of this, uh, of this program. He's also the uh, chairman of the National Business Law section of the Canadian Bar Association and uh, of course can speak about anything uh, in, that, uh, in that role. Um, Bob will be uh, introducing the, um, the speakers on the program uh, to you. Um, so without uh, any more, I, I give you the program leader, Bob Milnes. Thank you, John. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you here this morning. Uh, as you'll notice from the schedule, we're going to have two speakers uh, back to back, followed by a question period and then a coffee break. The first speaker this morning, speaking on the formation of law partnerships, is Mr. Barry Arbus, QC, of the firm of Lyon, Arbus and Goodman. Mr. Arbus was educated at the University of Toronto and Osgoode Hall and subsequently obtained a master's degree from Osgoode Hall. Um, he was called to the bar in 1967 and was appointed a Queen's Council in 1981. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Arbus. Barry. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen present time, there are over 700,000 lawyers in the United States and Canada. This equates to roughly one lawyer for every 400 people. As well, there are over 30,000 lawyers being called to the bar annually. In 1970, over half the practicing lawyers in North America were sole practitioners. Today, approximately 15 years later, this number has been drastically reduced to where over 75% of lawyers engaged in private practice are engaged in one form of partnership or other professional association. These figures dramatically demonstrate the greater pressures which are being placed on us as professionals from both within the profession and without. To be successful today, requires and will continue to require in the declining years of this century well-defined objectives that must be constantly reviewed in light of the changing demands on our profession. There are many alternatives to partnership that could be established and these often arise out of circumstances which are created by the environment where the decision to practice solo is created. Some of the examples of the alternative arrangements to partnership include office sharing arrangements, arrangements where one is described as a council on a fee for, uh, for services basis, and larger office sharing arrangements between a number of sole practitioners. There's no question that although the tide is flowing in favor of larger associations, there will continue to be room for the, well the efficient, well-organized sole practitioner, provided that he is able to avail himself of the benefits of a larger organization. A professional law practice is engaged in the business of providing professional services to the public. To be successful, the objectives and organizational structures of the firm must be constantly reviewed in light of the changing demands of the public and the changing needs of the partners. In this respect, the law firm is no different than any other supplier of goods and services to the public. 
the concept of management by objective, planning for profit, have to be concepts that are adopted by law firms. And certainly, these are concepts that will be utilized more and more by law firms if they hope to be competitive in changing times. To be successful requires an organizational structure which will enable professionals to devote substantially all of their time to their professional practice. It's interesting to note that a law practice encompasses the worst attributes of any business relationship. Only in a professional partnership would you have the unenviable situation where the same people are both the owners, the managers, and the laborers, all in one. And it's important to examine these various roles as distinct entities from each other. A law partnership requires an organizational structure which will enable the management and affairs of the partnership to be dealt with. In a solo or a small partnership, management decisions can be made on a consensus basis. But as the partnership grows, it will of necessity require more formal structures to, to be established. In addition, it will require the delegation of authority from all partners to one or more of their numbers. Partnerships, which consist of large numbers, must establish frameworks which will deal with the interrelationships of the partners and delegate to management committees and other subcommittees authority to deal with and manage the affairs of the partnership. By reviewing the considerations and items to be considered in drafting a partnership agreement, it's important to understand that the allocation of annual income between partners represents the largest single problem facing law firms today. The inability to crystallize in writing a definitive method for profit sharing arrangement amongst partners probably represents the single most important reason why many firms have been unable to commit to writing a formal partnership arrangement. The method of allocating income will be affected to some extent by the capital structure of the firm. And as a result, the basis of arriving at capital contributions to be made by new partners joining the firm. There are a variety of methods of allocating partnership income. Just because one formula works for one firm does not mean that it will work for others. Warren Grover, in the 1977 special lecture series, set out four possible alternatives of dividing up the profits. The first method that he described is what he called the benevolent dictatorship. This usually was an outgrowth of the sole practitioner who had set up his firm. The firm grew, but he still continued to be responsible for the rainmaking of the firm. It just didn't work in most cases. The second method described by Grover was the split the pie committee. That's where the allocation of profits is delegated to a management committee and usually works best where there's a large firm and most partners are put on a salary type basis and then at the end of the year they, they split up whatever was left over. The third method he described is the bear pit system. And this, the end of the year all partners sat down and they just didn't leave the room until they had arrived at some method of allocating the profits between them. The problem with this kind of system is it usually results in acrimony permanent scars between the partners. The fourth method described by Grover is the formula system. I think we've all heard the, the term the hail and door system which was developed in Boston in the early 1940s. I dare say there are probably few of us here who could actually understand that system or apply it to a, uh, to a law firm today. However, the advantage of any formula is that each lawyer can generally project in advance the compensation that he will be making for the ensuing year and will be able to budget his life accordingly. Most formulas should reflect in the income to the individual partners 
the fees that he's billed, the hours that he's documented to clients' time, spent, time spent in firm management, time devoted to community affairs, business development, new clients, and client responsibility within the firm. No method, system, formula, or non-formula will work unless it's fair and equitable to the majority of the partners within the firm. In re reviewing profit-sharing formulas, I submit there are two significantly different approaches to formulas that we should examine. First, the partners can agree in advance to divide the partnership pie on a prorated or percentage basis amongst the partners, reflecting historic considerations and historic ownership amongst the firm. The percentage of interest in the profits might or might not be a direct reflection of the percentages of capital ownership within the firm. This method allows each partner to draw a certain amount during the year in anticipation of a certain pre-estimated allocation of partnership profits. The advantages of this system is that it allows each partner to plan his finances during the year, generally knowing the amount of profits that he is likely to earn during the year. The disadvantage, of course, is that it tends to reward historic contributions rather than the current year's contribution to the firm. The second method is the pure formula system. And an example, as I said, is the Hale and Orr system. This method breaks out each year the share of profits of the firm based on a strict formula, based on the introduction of new clients, the number of hours billed, fees collected, and other contributions to the firm. This method divides the profitably based on the current year's profits and the current year's contributions. This method works best where there is a pool of funds available at the end of the year to distribute where the formula just doesn't work equitably. The advantage of this system is that it properly allocates and distributes the profits of the firm during the current year, while at the same time, by having a residual fund, it rewards those members who would be treated unfairly by the strict application of any formula. There are a number of disadvantages to the, this latter pure formula method that I've described. First, any application generally would ignore historic contributions to the firm. It tends to ignore management contributions to the firm and would as well overlook those members of the firm who do unprofitable work. But this work would still be essential to any growing law firm. Second, any strict application of a formula requires a tremendous amount of time in just developing and reviewing the formula. I think as well any formula tends to encourage partners to cherry pick the files that they work on and would encourage them to delegate to juniors and, and associates the less profitable files. It's common that even when a formula basis is being arrived at, to allocate a fixed sum or a fixed percentage of the firm profits to be set aside and be divided up by the management committee of the firm. Uh, this is good and should be used because there's just too many cases where a formula, no matter how equitable it is, just doesn't work. How often should the income sharing arrangements between partners be reviewed? I would suggest that in most firms it should be done annually. And certainly, out of necessity, any income distribution system has to be reviewed upon the admission of new partners. Although it would appear that there are a number of profit sharing arrangements available, certainly none are perfect. All should be examined in preparing any partnership arrangement. And each firm will have to develop its own combination of salary formula, unit division of profits, or any other alternative which works for it. 
I think the key to any profit sharing arrangement is flexibility and constant review. Any profit sharing arrangement must be reflective of the times, must allow for the admission of new partners so that they will be able to earn reasonable levels of income while at the same time reflecting the contributions and efforts of senior members of the firm. Uh, the best advice that I can give any new partnership in establishing a, prop, uh, a proper profit sharing system is to suggest that rather than spending your time calculating how to divide up a static pie, you're better off divide, devoting your time and effort to developing ways to make the pie larger and to ensure that larger incomes are available for all members of the firm. I think the second most difficult problem facing law firms today is arriving at an equitable formula to permit new partners to acquire equity interests in the firm without undue economic hardship. The valuation of the law firm for admission of new partners is a two-edged sword. Just as it must be equitable for the admission of new partners, at a time in their life when most can ill afford major capital interests, any formula arrived at must similarly be equitable for the valuation purposes for withdrawing partners, whether such withdrawal be because of death, retirement, or involuntary. First, my premise is that any formula developed for valuation of the firm should be the same whether it be used for admission of new partners, withdrawal, retirement of death. No partner should either be rewarded or punished as a consequence of his having entered into a partnership <coughs> or as a consequence of the method of his withdrawal. I think experience has demonstrated that bargain prices paid at the time of admission and yielding bonus payments at the time of withdrawal can only create further acrimony as well as financial drain on the partnership. Second, I think as firms are expand, experiencing rapid growth, and certainly this is the trend in most major urban areas today, I submit that too much time and attention has been placed on valuation for the admission of new partners, and not enough emphasis is being placed on formulas to be used at the time of retirement, withdrawal, or death. Most firms today resemble pyramids, with few older partners at the top and many younger partners and associates at the bottom of the firm. And unless formulas are established at the beginning of the partnership to allow for the proper funding of these partners as they mature, retire, and die, Potential financial drain on the law firms could be disastrous. In valuing the law firm, like any other business, it's a fairly simple exercise to state that the net worth of the firm is the total of all the assets less the total of all the liabilities resulting in the capital or the equity of the firm. Most partnerships prepare a financial statement at year end which reflects the capital of the firm and apportions it amongst the partners, depending on the ownership and the ratio that they own the firm. Since 1971, when all law firms were placed on a modified accrual basis by the Income Tax Department, the financial statement of the law firm will re reflect the value of the firm with two glaring exceptions. First, goodwill, and secondly, work in progress. And I think it's certainly worth a few moments to examine both of these. In looking at goodwill, I believe there are three possible types of goodwill in a law firm, just as there are in any other business. First, the goodwill of location. Second, corporate goodwill associated with the name of the firm within the community. And third, the personal goodwill of the individual members of the firm. It's my opinion that the first two forms of goodwill are truly firm assets 
and should not be the proper subject matter of either acquisition by an individual or payment to him upon his withdrawal or death. The location, firm name, and community goodwill preceded the individual and will certainly continue after his leaving. The third form of goodwill is unique to the individual members of the firm, for which they should not be compensated upon the admission of a new partner, just as the individual entering in the partnership should not be compensated for the personal goodwill which he brings to the firm. Upon leaving, the personal goodwill of the individual partners remains with the firm, just as the leaving partner takes his personal goodwill with him. The only time that the personal goodwill dissipates is upon death or retirement from practice. It's the writer's contention that personal goodwill is an easy element to fund in any law partnership. Each partner should value what he thinks his personal goodwill is worth purchase a life insurance policy for an amount equal to what his ego dictates his personal goodwill is worth. If he feels he has no personal goodwill, he has no problem. If he thinks his personal goodwill is worth a million dollars, so be it, and let him purchase a life insurance policy for that amount. This methodology of valuing goodwill would be consistent with the approach which states that whatever you bring into the firm, you take with you. And whatever you pay for when you come in, you get paid for when you leave. And I think by eliminating the total concept of goodwill, you have simplified the entire process and made it more affordable for the law firm to finance acquisitions and dispositions. Work and process presents a totally different problem. And I think this can best be demonstrated by pointing out that there's a difference between the tax paid elements of the equity of the firm, namely the capital accounts, and the non-tax paid elements, namely work in progress. If you're selling to a new partner an interest in the firm, you're selling him a capital asset. But if you're selling him a piece of the work in progress, he's going to have to pay tax on that work in process when he receives a chunk of it after the billings have been converted from work in progress to finished work as income. This is going to have consequences both at the time of purchase and at withdrawal, retirement, or death. Therefore, any formula for valuation of work in progress must take cognizance of this fact. Until recently, work in progress was an illusory item with most firms. Since we are unable or unwilling to value these, but with modern technology, most firms are certainly able to measure work in progress on a very current basis. In valuing work in progress, one first has to look at its age, make some calculation for its current weight worth based on that. Second, I think one has to apply a factor for bad debt, losses, and other normal business considerations. Finally, a factor should be imputed for taxes which the partners will have ultimately to pay on their work in progress as it's converted into tax paid equity in the firm. I think any formula arrived at can be utilized for the admission of new partners that is not too onerous to the new partners and to the existing partners. Similarly, in the case of withdrawing partners or a deceased partner, it's important that the partnership agreement spell out in detail whether the payment to the withdrawing or deceased partner is going to be a payment out of income or capital. Failure of the agreement to specify whether these payments are income or capital will certainly lead to difficulty, not only between the partners, but with the income tax department. One of the problems facing most law firms is how best to structure the purchase of an interest in the firm by a new partner, both ensuring that the acquisition is fair to the existing partners and not overly onerous to the new partners so as to discourage the new partners 
from acquiring an interest in the firm. It's not uncommon today to hear that a prospective partner has declined partnership because he simply can't afford the financial drain of partnership acquisition. Although each situation is unique, two considerations which have been effectively used I'd like to outline. First, rather than having the new partner acquire tax-paid capital interests from existing partners, you use the firm's existing balance sheet at year-end, which excludes valuation for goodwill and work in progress, and make a statement that all present capital in the firm belongs to the existing partners, therefore eliminating the need for new partners to actually lay out any cash to purchase a share in the capital of the firm. As a result, the only cash to be paid by the new partners is for work in progress and goodwill, if any. Secondly, any, a formula can be arrived at where the work in progress is acquired over a lengthy period of time, such as 10 years, and provide that any new partner would acquire the work in progress on a discounted basis over that period, but similarly provide that if he leaves at any time before the 10-year period, the purchase price for his share of the work in progress would be similarly discounted. This ensures equitable treatment between the existing partners and a newly admitted partner. Similarly, deferred payments could be and should be used for firms in the event of death, withdrawal, or retirement to ensure the absence of financial drain upon the firm. Now, up until now, I believe I've dealt with what I feel are the major substantive areas in management and operation of the law firm. However, I think there are other considerations to be examined, particularly, I think, which are relevant to the establishment of a new partnership or small firms which are planning for the future. I think each partnership, particularly at the time of inception, or in the case of a merger of two existing law firms, must decide whether to institutionalize its firm name or whether to describe it simply as a loose association of a number of individuals. It's important, though, to avoid disagreement later to determine at its inception some consensus upon the future changes in the name as well as the partnership approach to the name. Further, it's indeed rare to find either a universal policy towards vacations or sabbaticals amongst law firms. And I would suggest that it's even rare to find a statement about vacations and sabbaticals in any law partnership agreement. With changing attitudes, changing lifestyles, the need to accommodate differing attitudes towards today's professional practices, I think a firm position on vacations and sabbaticals must be covered in any partnership agreement. In addition, I think any partnership agreement must spell out in detail those items which require simple majority votes to carry, those items which require either a two-thirds majority or unanimous agreement amongst partners. I think examples of the latter are expulsion of partners, changing auditors, uh, and things like that. In addition, partnership agreements should spell out in them whether proxies are allowed at meetings uh, or whether you must be there in person. I think as well any limitation to be placed on outside activities of any of the partners must be spelt out in a partnership agreement. This must be in order to avoid exposing partnership assets to any of the partner's creditors. At the time of formation of a new partnership, or certainly when one is preparing their first partnership agreement, death, disability, and retirement are not the most popular topics to have to deal with. However, properly prepared provisions in the partnership agreement must ensure that not only that the retiring partners or deceased partner's estate will receive full value for his partnership interest, but will receive it in a prompt 
equitable fashion, while at the same time ensuring that the firm's assets are not drained. Summary, the purpose of this paper has been to point out that we are living in a period of rapid change. Only those firms which have developed or which can develop the structures to adapt to change will survive and will succeed for the balance of this century and into the next. It is incumbent on those of us who wish to be successful to develop management strategies which will enable us to succeed in the future. The need to understand the delivery of legal services in a timely and efficient manner is becoming more and more critical. An important element of any such delivery of legal services is, of course, the effective partnership agreement. By ensuring that this document sets the proper structures in place to provide for the efficient and well-run law firm, this can set the framework for the law firm of the modern era. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Barry. Our next speaker today is Mr. J.C. Osborne, who will speak on the operation of a law partnership. Mr. Osborne was educated at Carleton University and Osgoode Hall and called to the bar in 1973. He is currently a partner at Macmillan Bench in Toronto with a practice uh, primarily emphasizing litigation. He is also a member of that firm's management committee and therefore eminently qualified to speak on his topic. Christopher? Thank you very much, Bob, ladies and gentlemen. The truth behind the matter is that I've only been involved in the management committee at McMillan Bench for a short period of time. And the only reason that I got involved was because I was found wandering at large in the halls complaining about our firm's management structure for long enough that somebody decided to bring me inside the tent and see how well I could do at it. What I hope to do with you today is give you some thoughts on directions that law firms have to look in the future. Some of the things which Barry has touched on, which for many of us are new and emerging problems, which we're going to have to deal with increasingly over the years to come. In the United States at the moment, there is a booming business in law firm consulting. This has really grown up particularly in the last four or five years in the United States as a result of the tremendous difficulty that some of the larger and middle-sized U.S. firms have experienced with very rapid growth in very difficult economic situations. I think typically all of us as lawyers like to think that what we're best at and what we want to do is to practice law and that running the business aspects of a law partnership somehow unfairly infringes on our abilities to get on with doing that. That's a very attractive position to be in and in the large firm where management on a day-to-day -day basis can be delegated to a management committee it is in fact possible for many of the lawyers in the firm to get on with doing just exactly that. But it would be a, a mistake, and in my view a serious mistake, for any of us to believe that law firms are any different from any other business. And if we ignore the business aspects of running our firms, we're shortly going to find ourselves in fairly serious trouble. We don't like to do it. I suspect that by and large we're not very good at doing it. Law school certainly does not equip us with the sort of business expertise or training that we need to do it and so we have to learn in part through a process of osmosis and in part I think through observation of the experience of other firms and other businesses in the community and the country. The first uh, topic that I was asked to cover 
in this paper is client attraction and client retention. Uh, the attraction of new clients obviously is an important aspect of the business of any law firm. Most of us are in growth patterns. Most of us are going to continue to be in growth patterns for the years to come. That is in part in response to growing client needs from existing clients, but it also requires us to look to the future and see where our business will be coming from in the future and to try and bring new clients into the firm. There are many techniques for client attraction and, and most of you will be familiar with the most obvious ones of uh, attending trade association meetings, speaking at seminars such as this, um, lunches, dinners, uh, referrals from other clients, and so on. I don't think that there's, there's very much that I can offer you in the way of new thoughts on client attraction, but it's important, I think, to remember that notwithstanding the need to go out into the community and actively uh, seek to attract clients, much of client attraction will depend on the reputation that the firm already enjoys. It will depend upon the individual reputations of the lawyers within the firm, and it will depend upon the reputation of the firm as a whole. And in part, at least, that reputation is really a function of the firm's ability to deal with its existing clients and the message that those existing clients carry with them out into the community. One thing that I think we don't do enough of as lawyers is to talk to our clients about what their objectives are. We have a tendency, I think, to assume that the client really wants to place himself or herself entirely in our hands, to be guided and directed by us as we think best. And while that may be true of a number of clients, it is decreasingly true, in my view, and particularly amongst what I would categorize as the sophisticated consumer of legal services. Again, to look at the United States experience, particularly amongst corporate clients, there has been a very dramatic movement in recent years amongst corporate clients to their own sophisticated internal planning of their consumption of legal services. They're budgeting, they are demanding of their counsel, that counsel budget with respect to particular pieces of work, with respect to time limits for work, they're fee shopping, they are fee shopping hard and aggressively. They are putting price limits on their counsel, they are putting broad restrictions on counsel in terms of what are acceptable expenditures of money on the client's behalf. Many of the larger U.S. corporations now routinely circulate to all outside counsel that they consider hiring a questionnaire which outside counsel are required to complete and return before the corporation will make a decision to retain them. Those questionnaires include questions on the numbers of lawyers in the firm, what lawyers will be working on the client's matter, how many of them will be working, what paralegals will be working, what hourly rates will be charged, how long the task will take to bring to completion, what overrun can be anticipated and in what areas may that overrun occur, what outside experts will be required, if any, to deal with a brief, what their services will cost, when their services will be reduced to the form of a report or an opinion. In addition, many of those clients are circulating quite detailed guidelines covering such things as legal research, requiring all outside firms doing legal research on their behalf to provide the clients with copies of the legal research when completed in memorandum form advising outside counsel that the corporation already holds a bank of legal research of its own and will not pay for duplication of that legal research unless they have authorized it to be done, having first checked their internal banks to be sure that it hasn't been done before. Guidelines on lawyers' travel. The days of flying in the front of large aircrafts and winging the Concorde over to Paris for dinner and a meeting may well be over. 
clients are becoming increasingly aggressive about cost control and they're inflicting those desires on their council and they're inflicting them with very serious determination. In the United States, the experience has been that corporate council in-house in large corporations are moving increasingly into the roles of managers of the delivery of legal services. And a lot of their time is being expended in supervising outside council and ensuring for the corporation that the corporation is getting the best deal it possibly can from those outside counsel. I think that's coming in Canada. We've already seen the start of it and I think we're going to see more of it. I think as well we're going to see it spreading throughout the entire community of consumers of legal services. You watch television, you watch shows like The Marketplace, other programs, television and radio, consumers are becoming increasingly aware of their rights generally and are becoming increasingly aggressive about the information they seek before they expend their monies. I was at a seminar in New York uh, about a year ago and attended probably by no more than half a dozen Canadians and a question was asked of the audience which consisted of about four or five hundred lawyers. The question that was asked was how many of those firms routinely told clients at the commencement of each brief what the hourly rates were for every lawyer that would be working on that brief. And on a hand count I would have said that in excess of 95 percent of all lawyers in that room indicated that that was their firm's invariable practice. I suspect that if you were to take the same poll in this room or in a representative sample of Canadian law firms, you'd probably find less than 10% who routinely do it. We've taken the position with clients for a number of years, and I think taken it with, with some justification, that we don't have hourly rates. That what we have are a fee-for-service billing system in which we look at the complexity of the work we undertake, the results that we achieve, the time pressures, the importance of the opinions given, and so on. I think there's truth in that, and I think it's, it's a fair argument to be made, but I can tell you that the experience in the U.S., and in my view, the experience in Canada, is that that answer isn't going to be acceptable for very much longer. I think clients are going to demand from us genuine and realistic estimates of legal expenses up front and they're going to price shop us. They're going to take us from firm to firm and from task to task and they're going to strike the best deal that they can get. What we've got to do in my view is become increasingly sensitive to clients needs and one of the best ways I think of doing that is to front load in a small fashion with new clients and with existing firm clients by discussing with them what their objectives are. What is it that they're really interested in achieving? I look at litigation because it's the field that I practice in. I now make it a, a habit to talk to clients in advance <clears throat> of a litigation brief about what, what kind of result is it that they want. Do they want a settlement? Do they want a trial? How much money can they genuinely afford to spend on this litigation and how much money do they really want to spend? Where does it become, from their point of view, a matter of diminishing returns? What's the relative importance to them of recovery three, four, or five years from now versus a partial recovery now which enables them to put the money in their pocket if they're a plaintiff and get on with their business? Do they want a Cadillac case or do they want a Chevrolet case? Within limits, I think we all have flexibility on how good a job we do. I think we all proceed on the assumption that there is a minimum standard beyond which uh, we will not permit ourselves to, to decline. There are certain things that we must do on every brief to do it properly. On any legal job, there are certain prerequisites that have to be done, searches that have to be made, opinions that have to be given. <clears throat> We're not going to price cut there, because if we do, we tread the, the fine line of professional negligence. But beyond that, there are lots of options open to us. If it's a case, again, to use the litigation example that requires experts, 
How many experts? One, two, three, five, ten? Do we keep shopping until we find the right expert? How much pretrial preparation do we do? Do we do two weeks of discoveries, or can we get by with two days of discoveries? I think these are things that within, within limits we can talk to clients about and we can understand how our objectives and the client's objectives mesh. The other thing I suggest to you is something that we don't do well, and that's client follow-up. We've done the job. We think we've done it well. We've sent the bill for it, hopefully in a timely fashion, and the client is hopefully pleased with the result and pays the bill. How often is that the last time we turn our mind to that particular client and that particular client's problem? With the investment of a small amount of additional time, I suggest that there are real benefits to be derived. Take the client out for lunch. Take the client out for a drink. Have the client into your office and talk about the job you've just done. How did you do it from the client's point of view? What's his or her perception of the result that you achieved? What is his or her perception of the timeliness of the delivery of the legal service? What is his or her perception of the fee that you charged for the work that you did? In effect, what you're asking the client is, did you like this job? And if you ask me to do another one, what would you like me to do differently next time? Did I not report to you often enough? Did I not keep you posted frequently enough on what I was doing? Did I report to you too often? And, and, Obviously, different clients will fall in, in different places on that spectrum. Some clients like to have reports, it seems to me, about every five seconds, whether you've had their file out or not. Others say, listen, I don't want to hear about it until it's all over and you can deliver a wheelbarrow full of money to my front door. Talk to them about that. Understand not only their, their objectives for that particular piece of work, but their general philosophy for legal services. What is it that they're looking for in this matter and in matters generally? And I suggest to you that the investment of that small additional amount of time after the brief has the additional benefit that the client goes away feeling that you really care about his or her work. Sure you've done the job, sure you've done it well, but gosh, you also want to know how the client feels about it. Did he or she like the job that you did? I, I refer to this in, in my paper as, as the bedside manner approach. Uh, and I, I suggest to you, as I do in the paper, that the doctors have understood for years that a good bedside manner is an important professional asset. I think lawyers are only beginning to have a real understanding of just how important that can be and particularly how important it can be in an increasingly competitive market for legal services and for the delivery of those services. I've given you in the paper some random ramblings, I think, on the subject of, of firm management. It's a topic that we could spend uh, a week on and not cover all the head headings that uh, you might think of. It's a topic which uh, produces, at least in my view, a series of uh, what may be fairly trite suggestions of, of things that, that a law firm needs to do to be run as an efficient business. Notwithstanding that they're trite, I suspect that each of us could look at the few that I've selected and find areas in which our own firms could improve. Budgeting. Corporations, individuals have budgeted for years. Whether you actually sit at home with a piece of paper at the kitchen table or with your IBM PC or your Commodore 64 and, and run a home budget program, you do in fact have a budget. You have an understanding of how much money is coming in the door each month and how much money is going out the door each month and therefore you have an understanding of the limits for your expenditures. You also do some future budget planning. If you're looking at buying a new house, if you're looking at buying a new car, if you're looking at putting in a swimming pool, if you're looking at sending your kids to private school, whatever it happens to be, 
That's, that's part of a budgeting exercise. What are my assets? How can I allocate them? What expenditures can I afford today and in the future? I was surprised in, in a recent discussion with a number of lawyers from different firms how, how few of those firms had a formal budgeting procedure. And by formal budgeting procedure for the law firm, I'm talking about a fairly time-consuming exercise, but one which is important not only from the point of view of, of actually looking at, at income and outflow, but as part of a planning exercise. The budget has to be prepared with a concise time frame, and usually that <clears throat> will be an annual time frame, and usually it's easiest to prepare it around about the time of the firm's fiscal year end. That's when you have the, the most accurate information, what you billed for the last year, what your receivables were, what your bad debts were, what your actual expenses were, what you paid for salaries, what you paid for rent, and so on. You can take those numbers, you can adjust them, you can massage them with inflation factors, with projected growth factors. But you also have to plan beyond the immediate time frame of that budget. Most of us are in firms which rent space. Most of us don't own the office buildings out of which we practice. Most of us, therefore, have leases. And sooner or later, those leases are going to fall due and we're going to have to renegotiate. We may be enjoying a period, if you happen to be coming up towards the end of a term of a favorable lease, you may be enjoying very favorable rent in comparison to what, what the market is commanding per square foot or per floor, however it's done for the same space out there and on the street. But all that that means is that within a year or two, you're going to have a fairly rude awakening, which is going to have a fairly serious impact on the firm's cash flow. It may well make sense to plan now to meet that rude awakening by putting aside some of the extra cash that's flowing into the firm to address that rent increase when it comes so that the shock isn't great in one year. It may also make sense to, to look at a broader range of options, including renegotiating the lease now. Can you go to your landlord and renegotiate now at an admittedly higher rent, but one which may be lower than you're going to expect to be hit with in two years' time? Can you sell the lease? The lease itself may be an asset of the firm, and it may be a very valuable asset of the firm. What can you get for the remainder of the term of that lease if you go into the marketplace with it, and how will that assist you in making the transition to alternate space? What are you doing with staff? The tendency in recent years has been for, for staff ratios to grow in relation to the number of lawyers in the firm. That's a very, very expensive tendency. Staff salaries are rising. Fringe benefits paid with respect to staff are rising. UIC, CPP, health plans, dental plans, insurance plans. And don't forget that staff occupy space. They occupy a given number of square feet, use a typewriter, use a telephone, sit at a desk, sit in a chair, have a lunchroom, drink your coffee. What, what can you do to curtail that staff growth? What can you do to curtail it without curtailing the quality of the services that the firm offers? One option I suggest to you in, in the paper that you look at is the increasing availability of a very sophisticated electronic technology, computers, which will enable you to achieve staff reductions. Computers are expensive, although increasingly the, the sophistication of the small computer is such that, taken overall, it may not be that expensive. But evaluate the cost of some of that technology against the cost of, say, an additional secretary. If you're in an expensive downtown Toronto office tower, and if you're hiring and paying a good legal secretary with fringe benefits, you, you're probably talking about a figure which isn't very far off $40,000-plus a year for that person. 
can buy a lot of computers for $40,000. If you can buy two IBM PCs, for example, and I don't act for IBM, so I'm not carrying an advertising brief with me today, um, you're going to get a five-year lifespan out of that computer anyway if you can achieve the reduction of one secretary upon the acquisition of that computer, you've just saved yourself $200,000 over the lifetime of that computer. Part of the budgeting process, I think, is to identify areas in which those savings can be achieved. Talking to some of the consultants when I was at the conference in New York that I mentioned to you a few minutes ago, their experience is when they get together with lawyers and they talk about budgeting, they talk about firm cost management, they talk about cash inflow and outflow, they get together and they sit down with the lawyers. The first thing that everybody wants to talk about is the coffee room, the photocopy machine, and where the hell all the paper clips go. How come our Xerox bill, if it's a Xerox machine, is X thousands of dollars a year? Do you know how much we spend on coffee in this firm? Great ideas. However, if you save $100 a year on your paperclip bill as a result of that meeting, you've probably just had at least six partners at $100 plus an hour spend an hour achieving that saving, so you're now down 500 bucks. Look at the things that really count first. Unlike the suggestion that you look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves, I suggest to you that you start with the pounds. When you've saved all the pounds, then start worrying about saving the pennies. And the places to save the pounds are on the staff side, they're on the rent side, and they're on the expansion side. Okay? Think about expansion generally, because expansion on almost any front of the firm's activities involves expansion somewhere else. If you add two lawyers, how many secretaries do you have to add? If you add four lawyers and two secretaries, how many accounting people do you have to add? If you take on an additional floor, how many extra receptionists do you now have to hire? How many typewriters do you have to buy for the extra secretaries that you just hired to support the additional lawyers? Planning and budgeting, I suggest to you, involves not only current cost analysis and future cost analysis, but maximization of realization. We talk elsewhere in, in the proceedings today and, and in my paper about specialization within the law firm, about the expansion of the law firm, growth of the law firm, and I suggest to you the need for future planning on all of those topics. I suggest to you as well that as part of that future planning, plan with an eye to profitability. Look at the firm's existing practice and try and get a handle on where it is in your firm that you're making money, where it is in your firm that you're breaking even, and where it is in your firm that you're losing money. And I suggest that you'll all find that you've got parts of your practice that fall into each of those categories. Now, the fact that you can identify an area of practice in which you're only breaking even or in which you're, in fact, losing money doesn't necessarily mean that you can get rid of that part of the practice. It may be an essential support function to other business that you do. It may be an essential service that you have to offer your clients in order to keep them in the firm and service their legal needs. Let's accept for the purposes of this discussion that that's the case. That does not necessarily mean that those are areas in which you have to expand or want to expand. If you've got a finite amount of office space at an ever-escalating rent, ever-escalating staff costs, ever-escalating interest costs on your firm debt service, I suggest to you that it only makes sense that your expansion occur first in the areas in which return of profit is going to be greatest. If you've got a choice between hiring a new lawyer and a new secretary in a break-even 
or loss segment of the firm versus hiring the same lawyer and secretary in a high profit area of the firm, hire in the high profit area. What we don't do sometimes is we don't ask that question. Somebody comes along and decides or tells us that we need a new lawyer in this area or we need to add a lawyer to do this kind of work because we don't have one. And we address the question philosophically, do we want to do that? Is there anything wrong with doing that? Do the clients like that? Okay, let's do it. We don't analyze the economics of it. And I come back again to the analogy of business. Look around at what businesses do when the economy turns bad on them. They cut back those areas in which they're not making money. They slow expansion into projects which are speculative projects for the future. They concentrate their resources in those aspects of their business where they know from experience that they can make a fair return and where they've examined the potential for the future and they're satisfied that the opportunity to make that return continues for them. All I'm suggesting to you is that as lawyers we do the same thing. It's not a novel suggestion, but it's something I'll bet you most of us don't do. Associates, a hot topic. Canadian lawyer, recent surveys in Vancouver, surveys across Canada. Traditionally, both in the United States and in Canada, associates have been viewed as a money-making proposition taken as a group. They are in part the source of that extra profit that the partners divide up at the end of the year. That's probably still true. It will probably continue to be true as long as we manage the hiring and training and compensation of our associates properly. Again, looking at the U.S. experience, and I can't